It's great to be with y'all today. What a very special day. Thank you, Pastor, for allowing me to come. So good to see Bill and Myrna again, be here with you. Exciting to hear what God is doing here. Awesome, awesome. And so as I was thinking about what to preach, now I kind of see why I think God directed me to the passage that I'm going to preach today. Probably one of the most familiar stories in all the Bible. Turn with me to the book of 1 Samuel chapter 17. The book of 1 Samuel chapter 17. And just keep your Bibles open, your app, phone app, whatever you have, because we're going to be looking at some different scriptures throughout this uh, chapter, and you'll recognize this story fairly quickly. 1 Samuel chapter 17, and beginning in verse 4. And the scripture says, Then a champion came out from the armies of the Philistine named Goliath from Gath, whose height was six cubits and a span. He had a bronze helmet on his head, and was clothed with scale armor, which weighed 5,000 shekels of bronze. He also had bronze greaves on his legs and a bronze javelin slung between his shoulders. The shaft of his spear was like a weaver's beam, and the head of his spear weighed 600 shekels of iron. His shield carrier also walked before him. He stood and shouted to the ranks of Israel and said to them, Why do you come out to draw up in battle? Am I not the Philistine? And you, servants of Saul, choose a man for yourselves and let him come down to me. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this day, for the celebration of the ministries, for your word. And we pray now to speak to us in Jesus' name. Amen. He was nine feet, nine inches tall. Well, if he played for Alabama, Nick Saban would have a couple more championships by now. What do you think? Nine feet, nine inches tall just intimidating beyond our ability to even grasp. But what he really represents, and I believe he was literal, but what he represents symbolically to us, all of us in our lives, are those incredible giants of opposition and difficulty and trial. And we all face them. The, the barriers that we cannot breach when hope seems out of reach, the gulf we cannot cross when all seems lost. Those negative habits that we can't break and the worries that we can't shake. It's, it's those things that intimidate us in life and we all have them. The question is, what do we do? Well, I'm so glad that God's Word really gives us a formula. As I think about these ministries and the faith that's being required and reaching out and new endeavors and trusting God. Today, whether it's collectively in the ministries that we're doing or individually as we face different obstacles, I believe God's Word tells us how to have victory, how to have victory in the Christian life over the giants of opposition. There's just some principles here that leap out in the passage. I told you keep your Bibles open. We're just going to go right from God's Word, and we're going to see how to have victory. Anybody want victory today? Amen. Amen. Well, look on with me. There's so much here, and you know the story well, but let's look further in this chapter uh, 17. Look with me in verse 26. You know the backstory of all this, so uh, we won't take time to review. Most of us do. But let's pick up here in verse 26. Then David spoke to the men who were standing by him, saying, What will be done for the man who kills this Philistine and takes away the reproach from Israel? For who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should taunt the armies of the living God? And the people answered him in accordance with this word, saying, This will be done for the man who kills him. Now Eliab, his oldest brother, heard when he spoke to the men, and Eliab's anger burned against David, and he said, Why have you come down? And with whom have you left those few sheep in the wilderness? I know your insolence and the wickedness of your heart, for you've come down in order to see the battle. Well, let's look just a little further in this chapter, verse 31. When the words which David spoke were heard, they told them to Saul, and he sent for him. And David said to Saul, Let no man's heart fail on account of him. Your servant will go and fight this Philistine. Then Saul said to David, You're not able to go against this Philistine to fight with him, for you are but a youth while he has been a warrior from his youth. Here's the first principle if we want victory over the, the giants of opposition. and Oh, they're always there. Listen, don't feel like when you get in opposition, you're out of God's will. That sometimes is the greatest affirmation you can have that you're right in the center, the middle, the big M of God's will. 
We shouldn't be discouraged. We shouldn't be surprised. We shouldn't be like, oh my, why is this happening? There's a spiritual battle going on. So how do you have victory? Here's the first principle. Turn away from defeatist thinking. Turn away from negative thinking. Turn away from doubtful thinking. It's always going to be there. That's the devil's calling card. He always likes to sow doubt. God's way is the way of faith. Satan's way is the way of doubt. Now, listen, we're not saying that we're unaware of the obstacles. David knew he was nine feet, nine inches tall. David was somewhat less than that for sure. Maybe half. Who knows? It's not that we turn a blind eye to the obstacles. It's just that we believe our God can do it. Amen. You see, Eliab and Saul thought that Goliath was too big to kill. David felt like he was too big to miss. It's all a matter of perspective. <laughs> and so we turn away from negative thinking. What's the thoughts and doubts that Satan is bringing to your mind these days? It, it's just part of the battle. And we have to turn away. It's the anticipation that God has something great in store for us. Amen. Victory is ours in the Lord Jesus Christ. we got to turn away from the negative thinking because it always brings negative results. By the way, can I tell you, and I, I, I think I could just label them in a loving manner, is the fellowship of the miserable. You know what I'm talking about? They're everywhere in every organization. And frankly, if we, want to be ob if we want to be honest, sometimes pretty much all of us at one time or another get over in that camp. God forgive us, okay? But we get down, we get discouraged, and we find ourselves. It's easy to talk about the negative. It's called the power of the negative. Pastor, I want to ask you a question. And I know this congregation appreci appreciates your preaching, and you, you never have this happen. But let's just suppose today that you were preaching and, and you have 150 people or whatever is attended today and they all go out and say, great message, Pastor. You really blessed me. You fed me. I'm telling you, I just feel like I've been encouraged and ready to go forth. 149 people do that. But one goes and says, you could have done a lot better. <laughs> now, which one do you remember? Let's just be honest. It's called the power of the negative, and some people like to dwell in that. But I want to tell you something. There's a power greater than the negative, and it's the power of faith. Amen. So I don't know what your battle is today. Collectively, as you're involved in these ministries, or individually, it could be a health problem giant. It could be a financial giant. It could be a relational giant. It could be a circumstantial giant. But we have to turn away from the negative thinking that's out there and even haunts our own minds. Amen. Well, there's more here. Let's just continue. Just keep your Bibles open right there. Let's look at verse 34. And we kind of begin to see how David responds to this. But David said to Saul, Your servant was tending his father's sheep when a lion or bear came and took the lamb from the flock. I went out after him and attacked him and rescued it from his mouth. And when he rose up against me, I seized him by his beard and struck and killed him. Your servant has killed both the lion and the bear, and this uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them since he has taunted the armies of the living God. So we turn away. We recognize that discouraging thinking and where its source is, and we turn back to remember what God has already done for us. Do you know the Lord Jesus Christ today as Savior? Would you say amen? You got a testimony, brother. You got a testimony, sister, how God saved you. Hey, did I hear the song, I'm not going back, I'm moving forward? My goodness, Richard, you knew my sermon today, didn't you, brother? I'm telling you. Holy Spirit does that. We got a testimony, and we go back and we remember. That's what David did. We're studying uh, at the college, I'll say more about that in just a minute, a book called Red Sea Rules by Robert Morgan. It's a great little devotional book if you've ever had a chance to look at it. I recommend it if you haven't. It talks about ten things to remember when you're up against the Red Sea. You remember how the armies of Pharaoh were closing in? And all you got is God, but that's all you need. Okay? 
But one of the things that book points out is how quickly we forget. The children of Israel had seen all the mighty miracles that God had done, right? I mean, brought Pharaoh to his knees, but now they couldn't trust God here. Now, I want to be confessional to you this morning. When I went to Bruton Parker, the challenge was great. In fact, the school was probably a semester or two away from closing. That's how dire things were. And I had to wrestle with God through the whole process. And I remember just wrestling with God and, and seeking that peace and saying, God, is this, how's this going to go? And God gave me a wonderful answer. I wish I had time to share the whole testimony with you today. But essentially, God's word came to me. Steve, it's going to succeed. Watch me work. Not like, hey, I prepared you from all your gifts and talents and everything's going to make a difference. Nope, nope, nope. Nope. You're just like Moses. Stand aside. And watch the power of God. And I wish I had time to tell you all the things that's happened. Our enrollment's up 50%. $15 million improvement all paid for in cash. The greatest thing we've seen is 370 students profess Christ in the eight years that we've been on this journey. And people said it couldn't be done, but God said, wait a minute, I haven't given my opinion yet. I want to know what God's opinion is. That's what really matters. Turn away from negative thinking and think about what God has done for you in the past. And the story of Bruton Parker actually is it's had about half a dozen times and it's 100 plus years it should have closed. But God says it's not closed until I say it's going to close. And that's doing its greatest days. By the way, we just got approval for offering a seminary. We're starting a seminary called Temple Baptist Theological Seminary under the auspices of Bruton Parker College. I'd love to share with you more about our ministry after. I'll be handing around. got literature on both sides. Either way you go out, we'd love to share with you that story. But David drew from his past. But here's the thing I struggle with, and i just got to be honest. I've been there eight years, and we've seen God work. But I look ahead. Boy, those giants look bigger than ever. You know what I mean? It's, it's like when we look back, they look like midgets, and when we look forward, they look like giants. The truth is our perspective needs to be <laughs> redone and reconditioned. God, let me tell you something. If God has saved us, I believe that's the biggest miracle of all. Amen? Amen. If God saved me, wretched sinner that I am, and all of us, our righteousness is as filthy rags, no matter how good we think we are, then we ought to be able to trust Him for anything going forward. David said, I killed the lion and the bear. I grabbed literally by the hand. That's impossible without God, right? And let me tell you something about all the enemies out there. God's amazing. Sometimes he'll turn enemies against each other, and we just walk on by. Years ago, about 10 years ago, out in uh, Paradise, California, outside the city, a man named Robert uh, Riggs was just up doing some hiking like he always done, had his big backpack, came upon, he saw a mother bear and a couple of cubs. That's kind of a dangerous situation. He kept his distance. He was just observing. All of a sudden, something leaped up on his back. He had his big backpack, you know, with the, the big rack and everything. Thankfully, even though it was tragic, a cougar had jumped on him. But his, his backpack and the rack and all that, it had been into that instead of him. Well, he was able to quickly shed it, but here comes the mountain lion, the cougar, ready to attack him again. Guess what happened? The mama bear comes up and takes care of the cougar. Cougar walks, <laughs> runs off wounded, mom bear goes back to a cub. Phenomenal thing. Let me tell you something. God can turn our enemies against each other. We just walk away. I mean, that's just how God can do. Because our God is able. But we've got to take confidence in what God has done in the past to look forward to the future. Well, let's look at number three. Keep your Bibles open. I told you. Move on down to verse 38. Then Saul clothed David with his garments and put a bronze helmet on his head, and clothed him with armor. David girded his sword over his armor and tried to walk, for he had not tested them. So David said to Saul, I cannot go with these, for I have not tested them. Here's the third thing. Rely on God's power rather than the world's gifts, talents, and resources. Now, God uses mammon for his kingdom. He can use resources, okay? But that's not what we put our trust in. I realize it takes funds. I realize it takes facilities. I realize it takes things. But that's not what we rely on. Saul said, here, take my armor. David said, I hadn't tested it. Hey, I want to tell you the world's resources have never passed the test, but God's, God's power has passed the test. 
Not by might nor power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. When you do the analysis of where the church is, it often seems hopeless. If you look through the scripture, I mean, what were the 300 that Gideon had? Well, what were the 12 disciples that Jesus commissioned? We're always just a few. Britton Parker College is not huge. Our total enrollment's a little less than 1,100, about six, 650 or so, those on campus, others online, off campus. We're not big, huge, we're, we're small. But you know what I tell people? I t- tell people, keep your eye on that little South Court, Georgia College because God's at work. It doesn't take the many. It just takes those who are mighty by God's power. As we think about these ministries, God's already done some miracles, I imagine. Amen? And what God is doing. Are you ready to look forward and see what God is going to do in the future? But I want to just continue on here. Look, look further in this verse, uh, this passage. Verse 48. It says, Then it happened when the Philistine rose and came and drew near to meet David, that David ran quickly toward the battle line to meet the Philistine. Here's the fourth strategy. Church, we're supposed to be on the offensive, not the defensive. We're so, we're so worried about let's, let's build a fortress, let's, let's hold the fort, let, let's hang on, let's go as long as we possibly can. No, it's time to deploy. I don't usually show videos, and I never show a video this long, but this is a unique video I want to show you. It's 90 seconds long. It comes from a pivotal point in U.S. history, the Battle of Gettysburg, summer of 63. The Civil War basically was decided at that battle. Which way that battle would come out would determine the future of the United States. There was one key segment of this battle, a regiment from Maine commanded by Joshua Chamberlain, was given the responsibility to hold a key sector called the Little Round Top. Let's see if we can get this video and we'll play it for you if, it, if we can get it. Half a minute down. Most of the rest are wounded. The left is too thin, sir. How are we fixed for ammunition? It's almost gone. Sir, we're running out. You don't have much left to shoot with. Some of the boys got nothing at all. Sir, sir, what do we do for ammunition? Sir, my boys have the red muskets and they're firing back with them. Sir, we ought to pull out. No, we can't do that. We can't hold them again, sir. You know that. Well, if we don't, they go on by and over the hill and the whole flank caves in. Sir, here they come. Well, we can't run away. If we stay here, we can't shoot. So let's fix bayonets. We'll have the advantage of moving down the hill. They gotta be tired, the Rebs. They gotta be close to the end if we are. So fix bayonets. Ellis, wait, Ellis, you take the left wing, I'll take the right. I want a right wheel forward of the whole regiment. What do you mean, charge? Yes, but here's what we do. We're going to charge swinging down the hill. Just like we pulled back to this left side of the regiment, now we're going to swing it down. We swing like a door. We're gonna sweep them down the hill just as they come up. Understand? Does everybody understand? Yes, yes sir. Okay, Ellis, you take the left wing, and when I give the command, I want the whole regiment to go forward swinging down to the right. All right, sir. Fine. Move. Hey, you're done! I don't use the show videos, but to me that really encapsulates where the church is. Did you hear some of the background? May not be able to hear all of that. Sir, sir, we're out of ammunition. Most of the men are down. We can't hold them here, you know. We got to withdraw. Not an option. If we withdraw, this whole flank caves in. The battle's lost, the war's lost. Can I tell you, church, retreat is not an option. It's not an option. But, but, but we don't have, we don't have. Whatever we have, whatever we have, that's all they had left was bayonets. History proves that bayonet charge was successful, turned the Confederates back, the tide of the battle was turned, the war was turned. I shudder to think what would have happened 
where this country would be today, we wouldn't have a country. Who knows what would have happened because of the bravery of the main regiment. Here's what I want to say from that illustration. we got to move forward. We can't go back. It's not an option. And we got to take everything that we have and we got to expend it. The reason I chose that for this message also is to give you a little testimony about Bruton Park College. I told you the college was in serious difficulty, as a lot of private schools are today. That's very challenging times. But God sent me there and gave me an assurance. I'm telling you, I was a little bit wobbly-legged at times <laughs> and, and wrestled with some doubts, and I'm not telling you it was easy. But when you got an assurance from God, you've got an assurance. And God told me he was going to succeed, and he's never failed in, th in anything in my life. I went to the trustees the first meeting. I showed them that video. I said, whatever resources, and we had a few resources left, and there was like two mindsets. One mindset, let's see if we can hold out as long as we can. Let, let's see if we can just ration the resources and just hang on, hang on, hang on as long as we possibly can. Keep the fort. I said, that's a recipe for disaster. I said, we're going to take everything we got and we're going to charge. Amen. We're going to go at it with everything we have. Now listen, I understand there is a reckless foolishness at times. God expects us to be prudent. I get all of that. It's got to be weighed and analyzed to a certain point, but then there goes a point where that doesn't do any good anymore. There was no more analysis he could do. He had to go forward. That's it. Now, Huffman, I tell you what, and ministry partners, my heart has been lifted here today because I don't see a church just trying to hold on. I see a church moving forward. I see a church saying, charge! Because God will be with you. Greater is He that's in you than He's in the world. Amen? And so here we are eight years later at Bruton Parker College. Boy, there have been some harrowing times, just like that battle, just like any battle. But here we are today, 50% larger in our enrollment. SACS accreditation, we received reaffirmation last summer. We were so strong financially, they didn't even send anybody down there to check it. Just, just the preliminary reports. How about that? Got SACS reaffirmation, no notations, no reports. Best you can get. And we've seen the professions of faith. I look at the future. Man, those giants look bigger than ever. <laughs> but you know what the key is? I'm seeing my God for who He is. I'm seeing Him bigger than ever I've ever seen Him before. Are you ready to move forward? You see, this is a passage of Scripture that Christians can claim both individually in our lives. Has somebody got some giants today that need to be slain? Can you just say amen? Can you just say, God, I'm going to trust you? Because when God's on our side, well, Paul put it this way. If God be for us, who can be against us? Church, ministry partners, I believe God's going to do things that you won't even imagine. You can't even conceive of what God has. As Paul said it, He is able to do exceedingly abundantly beyond what we ask or think. Amen? Let's pray. Heads bowed today. I want to ask you, ma'am, sir, today, all the partners we have, I know that you're in the battle. Individually, collectively, God never said it'd be easy, but he did claim he'd give us victory. I asked the pastor, I was talking about the invitation today, and I, I just want to make it this way, if we could do that today. In your heart, would you say, Lord, I'm going to trust you for the problems, the barriers, the obstacles, the things that are before me. I'm going to, I'm going to trust you, God. I'm going to believe in your deliverance. I'm going to live in hope and faith and not defeat and discouragement. And God, I'm expecting great things and attempting great things because you're a great God. Would you say that in your heart today? We're going to have the altar open here as the pastor is going to come forward and stand and we'll sing a, for a verse or two or however the pastor feels led. The altar's open today. 
Sometimes it just feels good to come to the altar and kneel and say, God, I'm trusting you today. I'm going to make this, I'm going to make this my Ebenezer. I'm going to make this my Bethel. I'm going to make this point today. I'm going to remember this is when I renewed before you, and I'm going to trust you with this ministry. I'm going to trust you with my life circumstances. Maybe you want to do that today. Maybe you want to become part of the church and this vision. I know the pastor would love to talk with you about it. Most importantly, we never want to assume that everyone knows Jesus Christ as Savior. That's not a religion. That's a relationship. The Bible says if we come to Him, confess our sins, turn to Him in faith, and receive Him in the heart that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Father, move now in this invitation. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you stand?